Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. Um, Church, it's a different morning. Um, And I don't know, I don't know, maybe it's just the, sometimes when you have all the rains, it just, especially for Southern California, I mean, that's like, what is this? Moisture falling from the sky. This isn't supposed to do this. Um, what an incredible blessing. Um, incredible blessing. For years, people have been praying for rains, and now we have an abundance of rains, an abundance, and, and the reservoirs are filling up, and, and it's inc- an incredible, incredible blessing. Um, But here's the thing that's just kind of standing out to me this morning is sometimes God's great blessings can seem like an inconvenience at the time. Sometimes God is doing something in your life that when he's doing it, it feels like this is just really inconvenient. This is kind of a pain. I'm I'm actually not enjoying this right now. Uh, We might even be tempted to think that it's not God, that it's, it's an attack. Um but he's trying to prepare something for you that you're going to need down the road. Like I know right now, we have all the water we could use. Like we have tons of water right now, and we have more water coming, more rain coming over the next three days. Um, It's because we tend to only think about what's happening right in front of us. Whereas I feel like God so often is like, yeah, yeah, I know right now it seems like you don't need this, but two years from now, this is going to be very important. So I just want to encourage you. I don't, I don't know where you're at right now and what you're going through, but I just get the sense that some people are going through some stuff and you feel like God is stirring up some stuff in your life and it just feels like an inconvenience. It doesn't even feel like a blessing, but um, trust him in this because what he's doing in you right now will sustain you in years to come. You have no clue that you need it right now, but you will need it desperately. And you'll be so incredibly excited when it's there when you need it. So um, that's just a side note. That wasn't part of my message. I just really felt like God was highlighting that this morning. So um, I pray that blesses you. Um, this year, our focus is bold. And we talked last year, our, our focus, focus was on closeness, on being closer to God. And, and I mentioned at the beginning of the year that boldness without closeness is recklessness. Um, so everything is done out of this deep connection with God. But once we're in this place of deep connection, once our hearts are united to God and our minds are united to him as well, uh, that the year before that was rooted and we made sure we were studying theology and thinking deeply about God and making sure we understand who is this God that we worship. Once our heads are aligned properly and our hearts are aligned properly, Uh, It's time to do something with our hands. It's time to get up and serve. It's time to do something and to be bold in our faith. Um, God meant something when he meant you. He had something very specific in mind when he created you and designed you. He designed you for a purpose, not just to go to church services. I mean, thank you for coming to church services. It's so much better for all of us when we get to worship together and we need you. Every one of us needs you here. But we are created and designed for a purpose. And it's time for the church to wake up and start living out its purpose. Get out there and start doing something. You you have the dunamis power of, of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. The word that it uses to talk about, the word that used to talk about the power of the Spirit inside of you is the dunamis power, which is where we get the word dynamite. You have dynamite power inside of you. What are you doing with that? What are we doing with that? I mean, I'm, I'm in this too. I'm, I'm working on it too. I'm trying to figure this out as well. Uh, There's a pastor who said this to me once, um, and it's just always stuck with me. Um, He made the comment that, imagine if someone came up to you and said, man, crazy thing happened. I was just outside on the street, 
and I got hit by a semi-truck. The semi-truck was going like 60 miles per hour, and it just slammed right into me. Isn't that crazy? Now, if homeboy comes and says this to you, like, when did this happen? Well, just like five minutes ago. You'd be like, you're insane. A semi-truck going 50 miles per hour did not just slam into you. Uh, how do I know? Because I would be able to tell if something that powerful hit you. And we walk around saying, we have the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. And I think a lot of people outside of the church are like, if you had that kind of power hitting you, I'd be able to tell. So, it, and, and, and here's the thing about the Holy Spirit. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to get to my message today. Poor Esther. Okay, um, so <laughs> the, the way, I, and I swear I'm going to get to the message right after, so I just have to say this. The way that the Holy Spirit works in you, um, and I've shared this story with some of you before, you've heard this before. When I was in high school, um, I, uh, my senior year, there was this really scrawny kid um, that would always come to the weight room. And he was frustrated because he was so scrawny, he was so skinny, and like he just really wanted to bulk up. And he's like, everyone else can bulk up. I clearly have no problem bulking up. Uh, but he could never bulk up. He was just this scrawny, little, skinny kid. So he started taking steroids. This is terrible. Do not take steroids. They're very bad for you, just to be clear. But he started taking steroids. And he was taking steroids for like six months. And he's so frustrated. He's like, everyone always talks about how you get so big when you take steroids. I've been taking steroids all this time. I haven't grown at all. So here's the problem. He stopped lifting weights because he thought just taking steroids was going to make him big. But it's when, when you're, and again, it's so scary to use this example, don't use steroids. But what makes the steroids work is when you take the steroids and you're working out, it causes the little bit of work you do to multiply and for you to grow incredibly fast. And, and if you're a guy, it also gives you moobs. So don't do it, it's bad. But, but but here's, here's the point. The Holy Spirit is, is a lot like this. <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit, please forgive me for this analogy. <laughs> Holy Spirit is a lot like this, right? I remember we got those, uh, what was it, the P90X videos that were really popular. Did I put those on and watch them, just sit on my couch drinking coffee, watch them. Did not change my fitness at all. I'm just fitness burrito in my mouth while I watch it. That was the only fitness I was having. But... Um, Holy Spirit is like this. His power inside of you isn't going to do anything until you start doing something with it. It's when you go and you, you choose boldness and you choose faith and trust and you walk out, start doing the things that you know he's called you to do and stop doing the things you know he's called you to stop doing. It's when you start moving in that direction that all of a sudden he's like, I can work with that. And all of a sudden you're like, Pfft. And people are going to be like, how would you get so big? It's like, Holy Spirit, that, that, that's how it works. But don't just sit back waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something. That's not how it goes. That's not how it works. I will say every once in a while, there are these rare occasions where the Holy Spirit will intervene and he'll be like, I know you don't want to do this, you're doing this anyway. And he'll just like move me to do it. Because I feel like if I don't do it, I'm going to die. And so that happens, but... 99% of the time, he's just waiting on you. You know, we talk about, oh, I'm waiting on God. I think he's waiting on you. <laughs> he's there waiting. When you awake, he is there. He's ready to do some amazing things today, every single day. He's just waiting for us to partner with him and to say yes. And I think if we started saying yes to God early in the morning, every day, I mean, what, how would we look different? How would we look different? Anyway, so our word of the year is bold. Um, and we're looking at what it means to be bold. And boldness doesn't mean harshness. But a lot of times we have this idea that boldness is harsh. Uh, boldness will be harsh when it needs to be. But boldness is also tender. It's kind. It's considerate. It's peaceful. Boldness is strong and confident. There's so much tied up in this idea of boldness, and we have to 
um, kind of divorce it from this bad perspective we have of being bold. Being bold is a beautiful thing. It's a gorgeous thing if you are doing it properly with a good heart. If you make sure you have that closeness, if your heart is attached, then you bring boldness into that, and it's incredible. Um, so, Book of Esther. We're going to jump in. Um, go ahead and open up to Esther. If you have the bold journals, it's the first book that's uh, listed in there. Uh, you can find it along the tabs on the side if you need to. Uh, but it's right there at the beginning. Um, so with the book of Esther we're emphasizing one particular perspective Um, I'm going to be emphasizing this idea of what does it mean to boldly care as the church how do we boldly care How do we live that out? What does that look like? And uh, I think there's a couple lessons we can learn from this book. Um, I don't intend for us reading this book together. The purpose of this isn't for me to explain to you exactly what every single line means and every single word means. We're not going to do that. The book of Esther is meant to be read as a story. It, It wasn't meant to be picked apart like that. Um, So we're primarily going to read it as a story. We're going to go through the first four chapters today. So it's a lot of reading. But we're going to let the story tell its story. And and if you you try to break it up too much, you're going to lose the forest through the trees. So we're going to allow it to kind of teach itself. Um, And I'm just going to jump in every once in a while and, and give you some boldly caring highlights that stand out to me as I read it. Now, I should probably mention, I'm probably going to offend people with the things I'm about to say. Um, yeah, that's just how it is. I'm, I'm trying to be faithful to what I really think God teaches us in his word. And it's going to be very countercultural in some of the things that I say. So I'm, I'm just going to ask that if I say something that sounds offensive, can, can you pause and give me the benefit of the doubt that I'm not trying to be divisive and try to hear what I'm saying. Now, after hearing what I'm saying, if you're still mad about it, come and talk to me. Um, But give me a chance to share what I'm saying um, and try to find the truth in it. And Lord, help me to say what you are saying. Here we go. Esther 1. Oh, quick side note. Uh, This past week has been a... um, challenging week. My mentor and uh, a a man who was very important in the forming of this church, Albie Pearson, um, passed away. Um, I'm not ready to talk about it yet. I'm going to talk to you guys about that a little bit because he played an incredibly important part of founding this church. He baptized me. Uh, He did Corey in my wedding. And he ordained me. Um, so there's so much history there. There's so much uh, feelings there. And, 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 and I'm sharing this with you because I want you to learn this. I'm not ready to open the steam door yet. Any of you ever gone to a steam sauna? Uh, you need to leave the door closed so the steam can build up and so that you can kind of sweat and get the point of the steam sauna. Um, I have some pain and some hurt. And I need to leave the steam. If I talk about it too much right now, I just keep letting out all the steam. And I never get the opportunity to sweat and get the stuff out. So I have my steam door closed for a bit longer. And when I'm ready to open the the door and I feel like I've sweated sufficiently, I will share my sweat with you. I'm not really sure how that analogy works, but I'll share with you. But, um, But I wanted some of you remember Albie, and he's taught here a few times. Um, For our anniversary, our second anniversary, we gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award for all that he's done. Um, So he's an important part of the foundation of this church, and I wanted to share that with you. And I'll share more when I'm ready to share more. Um, So let's get to the book of Esther. Esther 1. 
This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least of them to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, Ab- Abagtha, Zethar and Carcass, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Okay, that's enough for a moment. Um... So according to Jewish tradition and understanding, uh, when the king is asking for Queen Vashti to come in her crown because she's beautiful to look at, um, what is implied by that is that she comes in her crown and her crown alone. Um, He began to treat Queen Vashti as part of his treasure. He was showing off all of the treasures that he had accumulated. He's showing off all of his different wine goblets, which, by the way, he took from the temple of the Lord. He's showing off all the different things, letting them see all of the incredible things that he's been able to collect. And part of that was his bride. Um, now, there's this frustrating idea like, oh, it's terrible that he t- treats her like she's part of his treasure. Um, and here's the first offensive thing I'm going to say. Um, I, I, I think there's actually something right to that. His bride should be his treasure. Um, so here's my first boldly caring idea. In marriage, your spouse should be your treasure and belong to you. And you should belong to them. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Uh, This is a deeply biblical principle that is so completely offensive to our culture, that you would belong to another, that Corey belongs to me. She's my treasure. But on the other side, I want to make sure you understand that I belong to her, And I hope that I'm her treasure. Um, This is hard for our world to accept. Um, Isn't this sexist? It's not sexist at all because we belong to one another. I'm not putting men above women or women above men. We both belong to each other. And, And I really mean it in that sense. Not like, oh, you're saying belong, but you don't really mean belong. No, I, I mean that. My beloved is mine, and I am hers. Um, The reason I think this is so deeply offensive in our culture is because no one wants to fully give themselves to anything or to anyone. We want to reserve, hold something back that's our own. 
And I think this has been a struggle in the church. Is because we haven't given ourselves fully to Jesus. Um, I, there's some songs we used to sing that I miss. Songs like, I Surrender All. Any of you remember singing that song? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my precious Savior. I surrender all. I think maybe it's become more, I surrender some. This over here, but not this over there. What would it be for you to give yourself fully to someone? To give yourself fully to God? Because our marriage is supposed to be a picture of God's love for us, and that's why it's important for us to give ourselves completely to your spouse. Um, so where did Xerxes miss it? If I'm saying that the issue wasn't that he treated her as his treasure, she was his treasure. Um, where did he miss it? Here's my second boldly caring idea. And some of you have heard us talk about this before. Open book, hidden pages. This is something that Corey taught me. That where King Xerxes missed it is that he began to treat her like she was the same as all the other treasure. That he could show her off like he would show off all the other things. He treated something that was holy as though it was something that was common. Now I want to live my life as an open book with, with the church and, and with my friends. But there are secret pages. There are hidden pages that I don't share because they are precious between Corey and I. I will tell you stories about our family, but I'm not going to tell you all of the stories about our family because there are some things that shouldn't be shared. They're too holy to be shared. And I think this, the, this example with Vashti is the most obvious example. It's, a, it's an interesting thing that he's sharing all these treasures that he's found. He's showing off the different paintings and the statues and the cups and all this incredible stuff, the gardens, and, and, and he loves sharing that with people. But he missed the fact that your connection with your bride isn't the type of thing that you share like that. Let me read this to you. It's from 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 through 18. Uh, and by the way, this is where Xerxes ended up getting all of those cups that didn't match. At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say? And where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Guys, you, you shouldn't be sharing everything. Part of boldly caring is covering. 
is protecting those things that are holy and are private and are important between you and the ones that you are connected to, the ones that you love. Um, I'm just going to go for it. Husbands and wives, stop exposing your spouse to other people. Now, there are times when you have to go to counseling and you need to get help from mentors. That's one thing. But some of you are talking to people who have no business hearing those stories. All of the drama you're having with your spouse. You're speaking poorly of your spouse in front of others. Sometimes as a joke, it's not funny. Stop it. If you're having troubles in your marriage, get help for those troubles in your marriage. Don't go exposing them to everyone else. Don't bring them out in a crown and nothing else for everyone to see. We need to be careful to cover and not expose. Singles, um, Stop exposing yourself to people who aren't your spouse. Some of you are sharing deep, intimate stories that belong to your spouse someday. And you're sharing it with every person that you date. And and physically, yes. I mean, that's obviously. You shouldn't be doing that. But emotionally... You're sharing some deep stuff that shouldn't be shared with anyone except for your spouse. Stop exposing yourself to everyone and sharing those things with every single person that you come across. Um, Don't cast your pearls before swine and give what's holy to dogs. There are some things that you shouldn't be sharing with other people. Be careful to guard your heart above all else, for it is the wellspring of life. Be careful with that. I'm going to keep going. Verse 13. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of the law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Kershena, Shethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Merez, Marsena, and Memukhan the seven nobles of Persia in Media who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memukhan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of the disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let an issue let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Memukhan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in his own script, and to each people in their own language, proclaiming that every man should be ruler over his own household using his native tongue. Okay. Boldly caring idea number three. I'm just getting ready to duck when you guys throw stuff at me. Every man should be the head over his own household. Um, so, like, am, am I saying these guys were right? Like, wait. Like, it's kind of clear in the story that they're not right. Why are you saying that they're right? Um, 
The problem isn't that Xerxes was being the head of his household. The problem is that Xerxes is allowing this group of guys to come in and be rulers over his household instead of Xerxes doing it himself. Instead of going and talking to his bride and making things right, instead of going and apologizing to her for exposing her and not keeping certain things hidden, he's inviting this group of guys to come in and tell him how he should run his house. He ceased to be the head of his household. Um, This is what happens when you start going out and you start exposing the secret things to everyone else because everyone will have an opinion and usually their opinions are driven by what's best for them not what's best for you because the first thing that these guys should have said to him was King Xerxes you were wrong go make things right but instead um, there's a tradition Uh, and it's part of the Jewish writings, the Hebrew writings, that Memukan, the one who came up with this whole idea, was having troubles with his wife. They were struggling. And so he made this rule so that things would be better for him at home. He didn't care about Xerxes. And that's what happens when you let someone else be rulers of your household, when you let the school districts be rulers of your household when you let media be rulers of your household, when you let government be rulers of your household, you invite them to come in and tell you how things should be. Because they don't care about you. They're just doing what's best for them. Um, I also want to make sure I'm clear about something. I've said it a few times, and I don't know if you've picked up on it, but there's a very subtle difference. He invited all these people to come in and be rulers over his household. Men, you're not supposed to be rulers over your household. You're supposed to be the head of the household. And that's a completely different thing. A ruler commands, but a head leads. Um, Let me flesh that out a little bit. A ruler will try to tell everyone in the family what they must do. This is not how you do this. A head of a household will lead them in doing what must be done. So let me just make this really practical. A ruler of the household is clean up the kitchen. A head of the household starts cleaning up the kitchen and maybe invites them to help out. I'm just trying to give you this very practical, the difference. A ruler demands but a head serves. A ruler will demand that they are served by others. Like, do what I need. Do what I want. Do the things that will make me happy. Whereas a head of the household is always going to be focused on how can I serve the desires of the members of my household? How can I serve them? How can I find their dreams and help them to make their dreams come true? How can I seek what I know my bride needs more than anything else? How can I do that? That's what a head does. A leader demands that the wife meets his needs. A head is completely focused on how can I meet the needs of my bride and make this household healthy. Um, There's this practical side of this. Because I know there are some people in here who's like, well, I've tried doing that in my marriage but I just feel like my needs never get met. Who's going to meet my needs if I'm always focused on meeting my bride's needs or my kids' needs? If I'm always doing what they need, who's, who's taking care of me? Um, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. You can entrust it to God. Because he loves us the way we're supposed to love our families. And if we will pour out all we have to serve our families, our spouses and our kids, we can trust that God will do that for us. 
This is what faith is, guys. You don't need faith to believe in God. You need faith to believe him. To trust that he will actually do it for you. Boldly caring idea number four. Um, as I'm looking through chapter two, or chapter one, the end of it. Pride will always make you choose answers that make you look good, but are bad for your relationships. Pride will always make you choose answers that will make you look good, but are bad for your relationships. I, there's no question about it. Xerxes was mad because she didn't do what he asked, him, asked her to do. He got a little too drunk and tried to show her off, made a bad choice, and tried to have her come and stand before everyone completely exposed. His pride was hurt because she said no. He was embarrassed. It's a scary thing. He was embarrassed, so he allowed himself to be deprived of his treasure. She was his treasure, guys. I, I, I am totally convinced that Xerxes actually did love Vashti. He was incredibly pleased with her. He enjoyed her company. He enjoyed her presence. I mean, you're... You're talking about a king in the time when they had harems and he chose to make her his queen. That was a choice he made. Now, not getting into all the difficulties of him having a harem and how horrible that is, which it is incredibly horrible, but there's something in him that realized, oh, this one woman I am in love with. There's something about her that is different than all the others and she stands out. I think he really loved her and he allowed his pride to get in the way and he made a decision that made him look good. That's it. You're, never, you're not going to come when I ask you to come. You're never going to be in my presence again. Wow, look how strong he is. But then he lost his treasure. He lost his relationship. Instead of humbling himself and apologizing to her, he cast her out and deeply regretted it. And if you don't believe me that he deeply regretted it, let's read the next verse. Later. Um, by the way, later means four years later. This is a long time later. Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. When the pride came down and the embarrassment was gone and the anger had been removed, he missed her. How many things have we thrown away? How many incredible treasures that God had for us? How many great relationships have we sacrificed at the altar of pride? Part of boldly caring is not letting pride make choices for you in your relationships. Stop trying to do what's best for you. Do what's best for the relationships. Because what's best for the relationship will be what's best for you eventually. It may not look like it, but it will be. All right, there's no way I'm getting through four, so let's get through two. <laughs> I'll have Robbie do next week, and he'll just do the whole book. It'll be great. <laughs> Later, when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for a beautiful young virgins for the king. 
Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful women into the harem at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who's in charge of the women, and let beauty treatments be given to them. Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. The advice appealed to the king, and he followed it. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought into the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge over the harem. She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place of the harem. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Before a young woman's turn came to go into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with oil of myrrh and six with perfumes and cosmetics. And this is how she would go to the king. Anything she wanted was given to her, uh, given to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go there and in the morning return to another part of the harem to take care of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the concubines. She would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. When the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king. She asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, but Esther had kept her secret, her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During that time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Bikthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Okay. Boldly caring idea number five. Um, I know I've talked a lot about marriage stuff and we talked about dating stuff and this this one's a little bit different. Be love to somebody who has nobody. Mordecai took Esther, Hadassah, uh, took Esther in as his own daughter and raised her. She lost everything. She lost her mother, she lost her father as a female in that time. Uh, That's a death sentence. She had nothing. She had nobody. He became something and everything for her. He raised her as his own child. 
Um, now I just want to quickly address this because this comes up a lot. Why would Mordecai encourage her to marry a pagan? Um, that seems like a horrible thing to do. The, the scripture doesn't say that. It says that they took her. So it's just the culture that they were in. They took her to have to go through this process. She didn't have a choice. Mordecai didn't send her. But now they're just trying to make the best of the situation that they find themselves in. He went every day, it says, to check up on her. Now this is a dangerous thing for him to do because he doesn't have access to those rooms. He's not a eunuch. But he would go every day just to check up on her and see how she was doing. when he found out about, about the plot to kill the king. This is an incredible opportunity for him to raise in the ranks and to become very popular with the king. He could have made his life so much easier if he would have just gone in to tell the king himself. But instead, what he did is he sought what was best for her. He went to Esther and told her, hey, listen, there's this plot. Go tell the king so that you will win favor. Now, she ended up telling the king it was Mordecai anyway because she loved Mordecai. But he gave the information to her because he loved her. He wanted what was best for her. She wanted what was best for him. And they both ended up winning out. You guys, you really can trust people with your heart. You just have to find those people that you could give your everything to. He gave everything to Esther, and she gave everything to Mordecai. Um, so practical side of this. Um, I think this is part of why we're commanded to love the widows and the orphans. Because they've lost everything. They don't have anything anymore. We're called to love the outcasts. The least, the last, and the lost are who we're called to because they all need somebody to love them. The least of them have been pushed away by society and considered pariah. They need someone to love them. The last, you're the one, these aren't the winners. These are the down and outers. They need someone to love them. The lost. Instead of getting mad at lost people for being lost, Love them and show them the way. I, I don't understand why we as followers of Jesus get so surprised when people in this culture make bad choices. They, they don't know any better. Even Jesus took the position with the men who are crucifying him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Um, here's, again, where I'll get in trouble. Um, stop being so mad at people who are identifying at LGBTQ. They don't know what they're doing. Why are you getting mad at a lost person for being lost? They don't want to be lost but they think they finally found something. Maybe if they were loved by the church, they wouldn't have to try to find love in other groups. They found somewhere where they belong. So they'll change their identity to fit it. I, I could tell you, being in the public schools, you want to be really popular and seen as heroic and courageous? Go around and tell people that you're gay. Everyone will be like, wow, that's, we respect you so much. That's incredible. Wow, you're so courageous. Like I, I sit and watch it every day, guys. You tell people that you are Christian and they think you're a homophobic hater and you're a terrible person. We are living in a time, gosh, this is so important, 
and I don't know how to say it well. There's never been a time when people have been more lonely than they are right now. We are so connected. We have so many friends via social media, via all the different places. People are more lonely than they've ever been. I can be confident, I'll, I'll just use a very simple number, that at least half of you in here feel like you're not connected to anyone. You feel like you're outside of the circle. You feel like you never fit in. You feel like you struggle with loneliness and depression because of it. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I, I'm confident, easily confident with saying 50%. And you're part of the church. you imagine what it's like for people outside of here who don't have the hope of Jesus? Guys, we have to be better about finding those people who have nothing and being loved to them instead of bashing them for being lost. Let's show them the way, the truth, and the life. You're here for a reason. You were designed and created for a purpose. You're here to serve a world that is lost. A deep darkness covers our world. And you are the light. You are the salt. If you lose your saltiness, what good are we for? What good are we for? It's time for us to find those who need someone and introduce them to Jesus. Invite them into the family. Teach them how to know how to be loved. Let it start with us. Um, we are dedicated and devoted to being family. You know, our slogan is where faith meets family. We want to be family. So if you feel like you're on the outside, I want to invite you in. If you feel like you need to talk to someone, let us know. But I will say this. You have to lean in. We can't help you if you're hiding. God can't help you if you're hiding. He can only heal what you will reveal. That's why his first question with Adam and Eve, when they had sinned and they had broken communion, his first question for them, where are you? You're hiding. He knew where they were. But he needed them to stop hiding so that he could connect with them. I want to close. I mean, there's so much in that. Um, We just got through the first two chapters and I ended up not doing everything. I don't know how I thought I was doing four chapters today. That was insane. (laughs) I need to work on my timing. Um, Family, I want to be a church that boldly cares. That's there for one another. Now, we're going to be messy. We're not going to do it perfect. I don't even know what it would look like to do it perfect. Um, I try to be intentional about reaching out to people who've left this church through the years. Because sometimes they left maybe because of bad choices I've made or 
I didn't say things the right way, or I wasn't there enough for them. But I want to be intentional about letting them know, no, I, whatever happened, I still love you, and I still think of you as family, no matter how far away you are. And even if you refuse to talk to me anymore, I'm going to always try to keep my love on towards you. And church, I know there are times that struggles come up amongst you and you have difficulties with one another. Can I just encourage you, don't give up on each other. And and, and maybe you haven't had this experience, but I remember growing up with brothers, we would get into these horrible fights and beat the snot out of each other. But the next day, we knew we were best friends again. Uh, there's something there that the church needs. I mean, don't beat each other up. But I hope that when you're going through trials and tribulations and difficulties with one another, like Peter and Paul did, like the Sons of Thunder did with all the other disciples, I hope when you're going through those things, you have in the back of your mind we're going to get through this and it'll be okay and tomorrow we'll be best friends again. That has to be our perspective. And if it's an issue big enough that you feel like we can't get over this, get help. Bring some other people in. Let's figure stuff out. But let's be devoted to boldly care for one another because if you can't boldly care for one another in here, what chance do you have out there? Let me pray. Lord, none of this is possible if not for your empowerment, for your grace, helping us to boldly love and to boldly care. Lord, I pray that today marriages would be restored that husbands would honor and love and give themselves to their brides, and that brides would love and honor and respect and give themselves to their husbands. That every husband in here would rise up as a head of the household, not as a ruler of the household. That we would hold sacred things as sacred and not give what's holy to dogs. Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart for the lost, for the least, for the last, which is everyone. Help us to be something to those who have nothing. Help us to show love and to be love to a hurting world. pray this to you. In your precious name, amen and amen. I do want to end um, by giving you an opportunity. If you're here this morning and you need this connection with Jesus, I mean, that is the most important family to have, is part of the family of God. This isn't going to be an emotional appeal with every eye open and no one's heads bowed. I just want to give you an opportunity to make a choice to be part of this family. So it's, it's as simple as this, just praying, Jesus, I don't know all the answers, but I do know that I am lost. And I know that you are the way. I don't have all of the answers, but I know that you are the truth. I thank you for giving yourself for me, and I choose this day to give myself to you, to be one with you and with your family. 
pray this now to you, Abba Father, the power of your Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And I just want to give you an opportunity. If you prayed that prayer for the first time and, and you are ready to really give yourself completely to Jesus, I just want to ask you to be bold and to take a stand. Is there anyone who would like to make that choice this morning? I'm just going to wait a minute. Next week, we will continue. I don't know how far we'll get. I'm done trying to put limits on what the Holy Spirit is doing. But church, let us love one another well. Let us boldly care. Love is even kind of, it's hard to use that word because it's just so misused. Let's boldly care for each other this week. Find someone this week that you can care for and reach out to and spend some time with. And maybe just sit down and listen to their story. Can we do that? Awesome. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.